Welcome everyone. I'm here with David Lithicum and we're going to talk about artificial intelligence architecture careers. Now, anybody that knows me knows I love architecture careers, but I am extremely excited about the AI architect world. And because of that, I have David Lithicum, who's both a cloud and artificial intelligence expert. And we're going to talk about AI careers. So, David, you and I have both gone through so many disruptive technologies, technologies that literally change the way we live, we work, and we play. And to me, generative AI is, you know, life changing and business changing for many reasons. Now, look, AI is not new. You and I both know it. And we've probably both been working on AI systems since the late 90s. But the point is, is generative AI is a new spin on it. And it's to me, it's incredibly exciting. In fact, I think most businesses at some point in the future will need to adopt some artificial intelligence technology to keep up. But it's going to have to be the right technology. It's going to have to serve their needs and it's going to have to optimize the business. Otherwise, AI could destroy a business just as easily as it could help a business. So David, what do you think about AI architecture and, and uh, what kind of momentum are you seeing from businesses right now? It, it's beyond explosive, Mike. <laughs> so I have never seen an interest in technology as quickly and as concentrated as uh, generative AI in the last year. And AI has been around for a long time. It's been around since the 50s. It was developed at Dartmouth University. And so it went through many iterations. I actually got into AI in the 80s. Uh, you know, as my college careers, I lisp an M1 programmer. Uh, and then got into deep learning and then got into machine learning as time progressed. And really, people would get in and out of it based on the needs of the business. And it wasn't until generative AI came along that we really saw the amount, the huge potential in this. Instead of just uh, supporting business processes with, uh, with a neural network and an inference engine, which is what generative AI does, uh, this technology has the ability to learn in an unsupervised way. In other words, it can learn from massive amounts of data that we don't have to tell it how to learn. It can just go out and, and absorb the data, unstructured and structured data. And the ability to generate net new content in any uh, framework that we want to see it, the ability to look at, you know, generate music, and the ability to generate uh, audio, and the ability to uh, generate writing. We always use, you know, use Gen, Gen AI to write a thank you note to our grandmothers and things like that. All this kind of... Uh, technology where the technology is able to leverage processes that are more adaptable to a way in which we do business. Machine learning really didn't have that in it. Deep learning didn't have that in it. So we had to add specialized use cases to make these things have value. Suddenly with generative AI, we have the ability to automate any, in, we uh, automate the stuff that information workers do, automate programming, automate the way in which we interact with a with an with an inference engine, with a um, with an e-commerce platform, all these sorts of things that are huge potential to kind of take things to the next level. However, the issue is we need to have very smart people who understand how to assemble these systems together and how to deal with inference engines, how to build large language models, how to understand how training data works, understanding the different security needs of generative AI, your ability to support, uh, make sure you don't poison the data from you know, allowing people to interact with the wrong way, the ability to have governance, all these sorts of things. So it's an evolution of a lot of technology that occurred over time. It's probably the most exciting thing I think I've seen in the industry, just if look at the momentum behind it. It has the ability to change the way in which we deal with technology and the ability to uh, provide game-changing, innovative differentiators for businesses in the marketplace. So now's the time to look at it, but you gotta be very careful. Don't overapply it, don't use the wrong use cases, don't overpay for the technology. And then make sure you're getting the right advice and getting the right architecture and how you're assembling this stuff so it's going to work for you the first time. And I think that's what people are looking at today. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. The last time I've seen anything almost this exciting was back in the late 90s when I was helping Internet service providers you know, build the Internet. And you know, that was life-changing and disruptive because when we took us from a physical world to potentially an online world, and now AI has the chance to make businesses supercharged if they apply it correctly. So, you know, I'm noticing all these little AI training things here. We're going to make you an AI expert in three hours. And, you know, I look at that and I laugh because it takes 10,000 hours to be an expert in something. But to me, we have to both leverage the AI technology, 
optimize it for our business, our use cases, our workflow, and then figure out a way to apply it to help the business as opposed to be a business expense. And that, to me, also screams architect, which is why I'm so excited about AI architect, because we can't just have a techie here. We can't have a techie that focuses on tech. We have to have an understanding of the business and an understanding of what the business's assets are, maybe data-wise, information-wise, understand the types of systems that they actually have and whether they could use them, repurpose them, add some GPUs or TPUs to them or outsource it to a cloud-based environment and then figure out the way they can use these technologies and then go figure things out. So to me, it goes back into the, we got to get this right. We can't just shove the tech out there and make it work like we've done for say electronic health records or other pieces of technology with disastrous consequences. So, you know, how important do you think business acumen leadership, executive communication skills are going to be for these AI architect roles? Yeah, I think it's going to be, I, I think it's, I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's about 75 to 80% of the role that they have. You, you got to remember that AI is an incredibly powerful technology, but the ability to pick the use cases and understand the business use cases that are going to be most applicable and most valuable for this technology is really where the wars are going to be fought, I think, at least for the next few years. So the architect needs to have a deep relationship with leadership, deep relationship with the business, understand all aspects of the business, and therefore be able to pick use cases that are going to be more viable for generative AI and allow the success of those systems. So the engineering of the system and all the things, you're going to have to understand that as well. But the biggest challenge, I think, is going to be for me to look at the you know thousand use cases uh, that exist within a business that we can use generative AI or potentially use generative AI, and then pick the top ten and then prioritize those and how they're going to leverage the technology correctly, and I think the biggest mistakes are going to be made over the next few years. I'm already seeing this occurring: is people are going to misapply the technology because they don't have the architectural guidance to make sure that we're aligning the technologies for the particular needs of the business. This is not technology you want to bind to a transactional no. system. This is technology you want to use when you're making decisions, where you're providing an enhanced customer experience, where you're, you're gaining knowledge that's able to be reused in the business processes, and you're linking it to the right parts of the business. So the business is able to operate on something that's going to be near perfect information. So optimizing supply chains, things like that. Right now, I seeing it, you know, seeing it do things like inventory control systems where it absolutely has no application. I understand that you can do it; you can always make it work, but it's never, it's not going to have the value. And you're taking resources from something that should be applied in another place. So this is about looking at the pool of resources that you normally you have, and you can't spend unlimited amounts of money. Where you place the bets, and what are the use cases and the problems that are more likely to be successfully solved with generative AI, and also the ability to understand the metrics and the ability to prove the value that comes back to the business and the ability to explain to the business leaders and the team members as to what you're doing, how you're doing it, what success looks like, and how the technology can be applied for this successful state. Yeah, and you, you really bring up a good point there. What actually is success? What problems are they actually trying to solve and, you know, when I teach architects, one of the things that I actually work with is I try to show them how businesses invest. Businesses, as you mentioned, only have a finite amount of money and they can invest it in project A or project B or project C or project D. And it's about which one is going to drive either the most strategic results long term or provide the best return on investment for the organization's money. So that's another thing that to me, the architect is very special. Not only do they have to learn that business. They have to help that business understand the value of the solution. So they invest in this solution versus another solution. And that then brings in more business acumen and sales are two skills, which are the best skills I know to increase someone's actual salary. So I tend to love this, but it goes back to making sure we drive and you gave a couple of drive the right transformation. You gave a couple of really good examples. I remember when I was in healthcare, architecting for an entire healthcare vertical at Cisco. And I would constantly meet with clients and I love doing that. I'm an architect. And the IT people always ask me the same question. Mike, what's the best electronic health record? What's the best tech we could use? And I asked them every time, could you explain to me the patient registration process in your organization? Could you explain how the nurses do their job? How the nurses find their equipment? What happens when the nurse eats and leaves an order from the doctor? How do you take a direct admission? How do you do this? 
And you could see the CEO, the chief nursing officer, the chief medical officer, they're like, okay, finally somebody gets it. They're not just trying to shove technology down our throat with which is the best, it's which one's going to work for us. And I think it's the same discussion we have here. What are we trying to achieve? Where are those businesses' pain points? What are their competitors doing? What can we do to enable them to be more competitive? Where are the weaknesses in their system? What can we augment? What is, and to me, that all goes back to architecture. So I love this. And I really love the architecture piece. Uh, personally, my gut tells me that this is going to be all over the place. Some of it will be done in the data center. Some of it will be done on the cloud. And it's going to bring us back to that 90% of organizations use a multi-cloud architecture. And I bet you when we're done with this, the things that have to run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, will go back to the data center because it will give the best performance at the lower cost. Sporadic things will be cloud-based. Where people will go to the cloud, they'll build it real quick, get it up and running. And when they realize it works, they'll transfer it back to their data center for optimal cost. Do you see it everywhere um, in all different environments? Or do you see yeah. it centralized? No, I do, Mike. I see it everywhere. I think, number one, the cloud can be way uh, too expensive to run generative AI because the processing is very expensive and the storage is very expensive compared to what we're paying for in the on-premise systems. Yeah. So people need to make build versus buy decisions. And obviously, the architect needs to participate in that as to whether or not we're going to rent the space on a cloud. We're going to use the cloud and host it on the cloud. And then also whether we're going to buy a system on the cloud or leverage a service on the cloud, or we're going to leverage some sort of an open source system that we can configure for our particular needs again on the cloud. Then also asking yourself, how are you going to do that with the on-premise systems as well? Almost the same problem is this. And do are you able to leverage infrastructure better in a much more scalable and economic way with your on-premise infrastructure? I agree with you that in most of the domains that I'm seeing, the on-premise infrastructure has a tendency to provide more value where the cloud can provide more convenience. So I do think yeah. that people are going to run and build things on the cloud because everything is there. They can auto-provision, self-provision, access the systems, we get things up and running and the big bills start to come in because we're spending a lot of money on storage and processing, we're leveraging GPUs, we're so expensive to run, that we're gonna move the stuff on-premise. And a lot of decisions need to be made as to, you know, how those things should be interacted one to another. And I think that, uh, you know, what's missing now is that we need to understand the life cycle of this stuff. The fact of the matter is it's going to be a system that's going to be the centralized component of what the business is. I think a lot of the generative AI systems, if they're done right, is going to be game changing for the particular business. They're going to be able to leverage it as an in innovative differentiator, provide a better customer experience, provide better productivity in terms of production of plant of uh, services and products. And by doing that, that means the system needs to be core to everything that is the business, and it needs to work and play well with all the existing systems. So not only is it going to be vastly important, but it's going to be systemic to what the business is, and it's going to run on many different platforms. We're going to see generative AI systems that span cloud, on-premise, edge computing, uh, mobile computing, uh, you know, aspect, and it's going to be a complex distributed system is what we're going to end up with. So. To put those together, you need to have a deep understanding of the business. You have a deep understanding of the technology and what, what it's able to do. You're able to understand the proper configuration of that. You're under, under, able to understand impact to security, impact to network, impact to database, impact to governance, and impact to other things you may not have thought of. Uh, compliance and regulations, your ability to deal with that as well, as well as with generative AI, I found that ethics is a big concern. You need to have an ethical right. understanding of how you're dealing with your uh, knowledge models that you're building, because if they're showing bias, then you can be liable for that bias being built in the system. So you need to do a lot of stuff, but it's an exciting career ultimately. And the fact of the matter is that it is really going to be the game changer for the systems that you build. So you're going to have a fundamental role in changing what a business is and increasing the value of that business tenfold just by producing something and producing a system and producing automation in a different way than we've, than we've ever seen in the history of computing so far. Yeah, and I think the computing power from artificial intelligence is growing up. You know what it reminds me of? When I first started working in networking, the first router I worked with had a 15 megahertz CPU. It had like uh, 16 megs of DRAM, and it could push 1.54 megabit per second of throughput. Now. A couple months later, or about a year later, they started using ASICs or specialty hardware that could do the routing. And they were able to go from 1.5 megabits to gigabits per second. And that was big. And then we started having routers that could literally have 110 gig ports and push them all at the same speed as the wire. And I think we're here. 
I think we started a little AI training on the CPU. Then we pushed it to the GPU. My gut says that we're going to have fully programmable ASICs next, and they're going to do things about 10 times faster than GPUs. And then we'll ultimately get to a hardware ASIC once we know exactly the models, and those things will be maybe 100 times faster than the GPU at a much lower cost. And at that point, I think everybody is going to be, is going to be leveraging AI everywhere. Yeah, I think the commoditization of the processors need to happen. I mean, right now, at the time we're doing this recording, there's a CPU shortage. And so yeah. the CPUs that are available are going to be held at a high cost. Well, one of the decisions that the architect needs to make is what processor infrastructure is needed to support the generative AI system. By the way, it's not always GPUs. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, it's CPUs and yep. commodity computing. And I think the initial systems we're going to build are going to be very tactical in nature, do not need the power of GPUs, at least initially. As they scale out, that may change over time. But also as they scale out, bespoke processors are being built by different companies. Yeah. They're going to be uh, engineered directly for um, the the needs of generative AI. And the, the growth of this is going to be you keeping up with the technology, understanding when to make the investment in it, when to make the risk and bring it in house, but also looking at the most economical and viable ways to do this. The answer is not going to be throwing money and throwing processors and throwing storage is the problem. If you do that, you're failing because yep. you're you're going to have limited value that comes back for the business because you're overspending on the infrastructure and the architecture. And this seems to be a common mistake that people are making. Yeah. I see people are over over engineering these systems and over provisioning these systems and throwing resources at them because they have no understanding as to what these things are going to consume where it's fairly easy for the talented architect to understand the processor load that this is going to have the network load that yeah. this is going to have the database io this is going to have and then back the appropriate technologies into it without overspending or over solving the problem that's going to be the biggest issue that's going to make this stuff fail. If we don't understand, there has to be a minimum viable approach in how we do the architecture to have the most optimized system that brings the most value back to the business and keep coming back to that as a core metric with how architects are measured in terms of their value they're able to bring back to the business. Yeah, in a measured approach, try, expand, learn, figure out what you need and grow it and grow it and grow it while starting out with the minimum while still building in scalability and the ability to, for the future. Absolutely. I mean, this has to be a long term understanding of the of the business and the viability of this technology and its correct use within the business and also how it interacts with everything else. So the generative AI architect, the AI architect, um, the person who's charged with making this happen. And by the way, that's a hot job out there now. Yeah. Um, needs to have uh, open communications with all lines of the business, needs to have open communications with legal because you're dealing with ethical issues that kind of come into play and compliance issues that come into play, open communications with your teammates, including your network teammates and your database teammates and your security teammates, make sure that they understand what their needs are and the roles that they have to play. And then also an open dialogue with the board of directors and CEO that has a, it has a huge interest in this right now. Uh, nine times out of 10, when I talk to people, within enterprises, I'm talking to the C-level folks. And so they're the ones who want to understand how this technology works and how it's going to be used. If you're going to take the role of being an AI architect, you're going to have to have the human communication skills to really provide the presence so you uh, you, you, you communicate um, confidence in the fact they know you're making the right decisions and also your ability to drive the metrics. And you can only show a solution, but you can prove that the solution is going to be optimized for what this particular need is. So don't let that scare you, because I think a lot of those things can come with training. And a lot of those Absolutely. things can come with a bit, ex bit of experience. And a lot of those things are going to be obtained talent that you, that you understand over time. But right now, we need some very capable and competent people who are sitting between this very complex technology and the business and the ability to make the translations in between it. And I don't think we have the, the amount of talent right now in the marketplace based on the demand and based on the supply that I'm seeing. And companies are screaming for the talent. And I know from experience getting architects hired everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean Apple, AWS, Cisco, Microsoft, IBM, Google, Accenture, Deloitte, KPMG, Capgemini. Price Waterhouse Coopers, and of course, big banks like JP Morgan Chase or Barclays Bank. And after getting people hired everywhere, I've learned that it's just as easy in most cases to take someone that's not worked in tech 
and train them in all the business skills, communication skills, presentation skills, executive presence, CX or relevancy, and teach them the tech as it is to take someone from a technology career and teach them all those business skills if, because they're so focused on the tech, the tech, the tech. And, you know, I love taking people with experience and I've gotten both people hired, but when you're new to tech, you don't really have any bad habits. You don't have any focus on anything. It's what you're trained. And when you are in tech, you know, you're going to ultimately develop a bias from years and years of what to work. You know, my brain automatically goes to networking first. Why? Because I spent most of my life in networking. And I work real hard not to be a hammer in search of the nail. But, you know, I think this is a career for everyone. I think companies are in such demand. As long as they get the proper training, they're there. And, you know, after interviewing thousands of players, what they really tell me is I need somebody that can do the job. I need someone that can communicate well. I need someone that's energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate about the work. I need someone that I can trust. I need someone that knows what they know and knows what they don't know so they don't make big mistakes and say, yes, I can do it and break things. They're looking for team players. They're looking for emotionally intelligent people and going above and beyond. Is that what you hire for too? And I know you and I hire a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. You're looking for the capability of someone who's able to continue their learning journey um, based on when you hire them. So they have and, and they have the skills that you're looking for to get them initially productive in the job, but also understand that this technology is gonna morph and change a great deal over time. They're gonna to have to adapt and learn and relearn different technologies. And if they have an excitement about that and enthusiasm to keep up with technology in the marketplace, the ability to communicate with human beings and the ability to communicate in different ways, that's gonna be the person I'm going to hire, regardless of where, where they came from or their background. Um, because if they show up and they're productive for me the first day and they're productive, they're going to be productive for me in a year and two years down yep. the line, they become kind of a trusted agent of, of my technology transformation journey on my team to make this happen. That's going to be a, a valuable skill that I, that I find is are hugely rare to find at this point in time. And so it's the, it's slim pickings out there with people that have these capabilities and have this fire in the belly enthusiasm for what they're doing and the ability to work and adapt and change and learn, keep going, make some mistakes and be able to learn from them and go on. And those are the people you want on your team. Absolutely. And I think we'll end it on this. David, you mentioned slim pickings, and that is the perfect <laughs> situation on the economic supply and demand curve. There's huge demand and there's no supply. And that's the perfect recipe for high architect salaries. So I think it's that. David, uh, I'm so grateful you were here. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience. And I look forward to speaking to you on another video. Thank you, Mike.